Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 190 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. We've been talking a lot about women's experiences through different lenses this year, as characters in literature, as workers, and as crusaders. But what was the general perception of womanhood at this time? Where did it come from? And how do medieval ideas of womanhood affect the modern world? This week, I spoke with everyone's favorite guest, Dr. Eleanor Yaniga, about womanhood in the Middle Ages. Eleanor is the author of The Middle Ages, A Graphic History, and the host of several shows on History Hit, including Medieval Pleasures, Exploring the Medieval Afterlife, and The Seven Deadly Sins. Her new book is The Once and Future Sex, Going Medieval on Women's Roles in Society. Our conversation on womanhood, the ideal feminine body in the Middle Ages, and how perceptions of women's roles have both changed and stayed the same is coming up right after this. Well, welcome back, Eleanor. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And now you have a new book out. So welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. I am absolutely delighted to be here as always and delighted to hype a book. Yeah. And especially this book, I just had to look at it and it's amazing. I love it. You just come out swinging and I just love it. Yeah. It's a, a labor of love, but also a labor of hate. <laughs> if we can put it that way, I think. <laughs> I think that's important. Okay, so you've called it the once and future sex. And I think there's so much to just pull out of that title. Where did mm -hmm. the title come from? So I wanted something that ordinary people would automatically associate with the medieval period. And so, you know, I was kind of thinking of like the once and future king and like all Arthuriana and stuff like that. But what I also kind of wanted to get in there is the point that gender constructs are something that has, has been happening and will be happening and will continue to happen, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's a point of looking at medieval history in order to understand gender. And it's because we're still doing it. Right. I'm sure we've, we've changed things around, but constructs are never something that is ever going to drop completely. So that's why it's important to have a look at the history more generally. So getting across the point that everyone is kind of a part of a grand transmission of ideas about women is was sort of the point here, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of it that you get into talking about the future, talking about now actually occurs within the book. I want to know why you picked sex and not gender for this. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one because I was trying to cast a very wide net and gender would in many ways work really well here because, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, when we're talking about gender constructs more particularly, there's no real difference between trans women and cis women here at all. Mm -hmm. Trans women are facing a lot of the same issues that cis women do demands to adhere to a beauty standard, hugely. Ideas about their sexuality being constantly dissected. Oh yeah, oh my God. And, you know, um, they're finding their place in the working world is obviously a really huge and difficult problem for a lot of trans women. Um, I'm using sex here more particularly because we do also talk rather a lot about ideas <laughs> about motherhood and childbirth. Mm -hmm. um, and that's more on the medieval period than us <laughs> right now. Mm -hmm. Although having said that, I think it's a really important kind of um, idea to trouble because, you know, what I say in the book is one of the only things that really stays constant about our ideas of women is that women are mommies. Right? <laughs> that's what women are. You know, they're, they're, they're either future mommies or they're mommies right now, you know, and that's the important thing about them. And so I wanted to kind of like get in that we were going to be looking at those aspects as well. But that is not because I take them as inherently feminine or particularly a part of the, the universal women's experience, because I mean, see your girl over here not a mother. <laughs> but it's something that we delve into in, in real depth. So. Okay. Yeah. I think it's important to establish that, especially when we're talking about so many things that have to do with social constructs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, to be fair, also, we've got some trans ladies in the book, you know, shout out Eleanor Reichner, mm -hmm. one of the real ones. <laughs> so, <laughs> one real you know, ones. And, uh, I love her, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, such an interesting story. And I wish we knew more about her. Mm -hmm. It's like it, she just comes in, tells this incredibly interesting story and then question mark, you know, where'd <laughs> yeah. she go? That's it's a, a real question for the ages, I think. Yeah, there's too many of those in this field. Why do we get into this field? <laughs> Well, and it's so much worse for women. I'd like this is one of the things. It's like you you get over and over like this really fascinating woman will show up usually because she's in trouble, 
Mm -hmm. right like that's how you you meet a lot of women uh in the medieval period is that they've they've transgressed something and they're in court and you get to hear this incredibly wild story and you're like girl what and then you never (laughs) hear from them again right because it's just like this one little court docket thing Mm -hmm. so you get these little snapshots of women's lives and uh, you know you got to kind of somehow put all those together into a grander photo album of the idea of gender in the medieval period like oh okay you know yeah, maybe it's like one of those mosaics, right? That are all made of tiny photos, and they turn out to be something beautiful that we can all understand. There you go. That's the way to think of it. There I think. Okay, so when people talk about women's roles in the Middle Ages, they always go back to the church, and we should probably go to the church in a second. But it's even older than that, right? So how does the ancient world inform ideas of women in the Middle Ages? Well, you know, medieval people, the biggest thing that they love is the classical period, if it's not the church. I mean, the church is probably number one, and number two is Aristotle, right? Mm -hmm. Especially theologians and philosophers who are the people that we get to hear from most Mm -hmm. in the medieval period, right? Because those are the sources that last. So these are guys who are sitting around, you know, they learn to read and write Latin on Aristotle. That's how important this guy is. So you can't have any conversations about gender and its meaning in the medieval period without looking at the classical antecedents to that. So I tried to pick out the guys who come up over and over and over again in the medieval period. So you see Plato a lot. You see Aristotle a lot. You see Hippocrates a lot or the Hippocratic school more generally. You see Galen, who is kind of like, you know, real cusp, like he's super late antique, but, you know, he's a Roman. So we're we're giving it to him and that sort of thing. <laughs> And these are the people that you'll see quoted all the time in authoritative discussions by medieval people. So if they're talking about philosophy, you know, there's Aristotle and there's Plato. If they're talking um, as physicians or they're kind of like discussing humoral theory, you're going to see Hippocrates over and over again. And you need to understand this basis because they're constantly talking about it, right? So I always say that the way to think about about uh, philosophical ideas in the Middle Ages is that it's kind of like improvisational theater. Similarly nerdy. And (laughs) the way that they're looking at it is that it's a yes and. Mm -hmm. So you take everything from the ancient period and say yes, and then say and the church on top Mm -hmm. of it. And, you know, they're incredibly clear about the way that they think about knowledge. They see themselves as being boosted up higher by the ancients, you know, the whole standing on the shoulders of giants thing. So you have to just give them the benefit of the doubt. That is their idea about how the world works and how knowledge is accumulated. So you have to take them at their word. You can't say, oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, that's who you think that you're inspired by? No. Right. So what did Aristotle say about women? <laughs> like, spoiler alert, it's God, not good. Too, too much. What a jerk. God, like per- <laughs> my personal enemy, Aristotle, he says a lot about women. And basically, for him, the thing that you've got to understand about women is that they are not men. Mm-hmm. So like men are the default human. And as far as he is concerned, all humans start out as men. And then something goes wrong in the gestational process, (laughs) which is what gives you women. And indeed, uh, Aristotle is one of the few proponents of what we call the one seed theorem, Mm -hmm. which is that he thinks that women don't contribute any genetic material (laughs) to the making of humans. He just thinks that they are the equivalent of some dirt that men put seed which is their sperm in and then you know maybe something goes wrong i don't know they talk they talk too much or shop too much or something like that and then while pregnant and then that's how you get another woman and the thing about women then is he says that you need to kind of think of them as what he calls deformed or sometimes (laughs) inside out men Mm -hmm. so what happens in that process is they just kind of get scruggled up somehow and you can see the physical signs of this because their genitals are internal Right. Mm-hmm. So basically, penises and everything are how things are meant to be. There should be on the outside of the body where they're viewable, but everything is kind of got up inside of women. So because women are not men, but they're kind of the other half of what it means to be human, women are then also this kind of negative reflection of men. So whereas men are logical, women are illogical. Whereas men are calm, women uh, fly off into a rage. Whereas men are able to control themselves, women are massively horny. Basically, anything that is good about a man is bad and in women. And then he throws some things in there as well, like uh, I think in uh, it's in his um, On Animals has this big rant about what women are and like in there he's like they're more retentive of memory which i just love because you know you can just see his his wives being like aristotle you said that you were going to and he's like these women 
<laughs> you know, and then so, it, and even then, this is cast as a bad thing. You know, being retentive of memory being a bad thing, or indeed, you know, being emotive. That's a big one that comes up over and over again is that women are overly emotional. They're in, unable to master themselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is proof of their inferiority to men. And all of these ideas will kind of hold through into the medieval period where everyone says, oh, yeah, that's absolutely true. But, you know, with a, just a gloss of Christianity on top of it. <laughs> so what is the gloss of Christianity on top of it? How does this feed into the church's ideas of what a woman is and does and all that? Well, you know, it's all about the Garden of Eden, baby, <laughs> which is a really nice thing to talk to regular people about after I've just been like, oh, and I think you'll find that Aristotle says, you know, yeah, for, yeah. you know, a few hundred pages or whatever. It's great to then get to the Garden of Eden because everybody knows that. And the thing about the Garden of Eden is, huh, it's funny. It's exactly the same story that Aristotle was telling. That's weird. Huh. <laughs> where the first human's a man, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what, when God wants to make a human, God makes a man in his own image. And he's like, I did it, everybody, there's a human. But then uh, Adam gets sad and lonely and God says, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll make you a wife, which is like specifically the thing, he's making him a wife. Mm -hmm. So he takes Adam's rib and ta-da, there's Eve, right? And we all know your trouble with Eve is that, oh, she's just a little silly head, right? Like, oh, she's unserious. <laughs> and, you know, she gets talking to snakes mm -hmm. and she can get talked into everything. She eats the fruit from the tree of knowledge and then suddenly everybody is duped. And there is an important thing to kind of consider from a late antique and medieval perspective here. So St. Augustine writes really extensively <laughs> about the Garden of Eden and Eve. I mean, my God, this man, obsessed. And the way that he talks about original sin is that it is specifically sexual in nature. So when Eve eats the fruit of the tree of knowledge and they realize they're naked, it's not them realizing they're naked that's the problem. The problem is that they're horny as a result of it. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh, oops, you know, and then suddenly everything <laughs> is sexy. And so as a result of this, this kind of like amps up the, the idea that women are kind of oversexed beings, which is certainly extant in the ancient period. I want to make that clear. But there is another realm on top of it now. Because whilst the ancient period looks down on sex and, you know, and sex is definitively seen as feminine and there's, there's all this kind of hand wringing about how if you have too much sex with your wife, you'll become gay. Uh, <laughs> things like that in the medieval period. <laughs> Wait, what? Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Because if you have too much sex with your wife, you become colder and wetter and she becomes hotter and drier. And then uh, you might start enjoying sex like women do. And then that means you'll have sex with men. So there you go. I mean, logic uh, right there. The boom, like it just <laughs> makes perfect sense, right? So the church has this, but, you know, they're more down on sex generally, where they're just like, mm, and they're down on sex generally because sex exists because of the fall of man, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this overly sexualized idea about women, but also more particularly, you have the trouble with women is that they're the reason we're all going to die. Right? <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the reason that we live in pain and that, you know, there are all the terrible things which exist in the world is is specifically mm -hmm. the fault of women. So that's quite a thing to sort of keep in mind. But then don't worry, there's some good ways to be a woman, too, which is, for example, you could be Jesus's mommy mm -hmm. and then that gets you out of it. Like, so if you go through the loophole where you're <laughs> born without original sin that Mary and nobody else gets, mm -hmm. then there's also a way to be a good woman, right? So you're really introduced to this idea of what we now call the Madonna and whore complex, <laughs> which is also, you know, the, the image that I chose uh, for the front of the book really kind of puts this into perspective where you've got the Virgin Mary on one side and Eve on the other. And then there's like a skull on the ground and then the snake and everything. <laughs> and you're like, there you go. Absolutely no subtext. Subtext is for cowards. <laughs> you know, the, the point here is that for medieval people, women are this necessarily troubling agent where in an ideal world, women hadn't existed for a while. And the reason why we no longer live in an ideal world is women. <laughs> uh, well, there it is. <laughs> There's the end of the podcast right there. <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody. Great. <laughs> thanks for coming. But one of the major themes of the book is that women are still considered as being wrong. The way they are being is wrong today, as mm -hmm. it was in the past. But this is different now, right? So women were thought of as being very, very lusty for many thousands of years. And now the idea is that they are not at all. They get corrupted. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? Ah, uh, see, so one of my central arguments here is that what we as a society do 
is we're constantly changing what it is that we like all the time, you know. So even for medieval people, they suddenly like, you know, God instead of polytheism, <laughs> right? Certain new things kind of come to the forefront, certain new ideals. And, you know, I would argue that maybe like I, post-sexual revolution, certainly, but uh, perhaps even like post-Freudian, we as a society have kind of decided that we like sex. We think sex is kind of good now. You know, we've got this whole sex positivity thing now where it's like, oh no, sex is a good thing and everybody, you know, should be enjoying sex. So because sex is a good thing now, women don't like it, <laughs> right? <laughs> when sex was a bad thing in the ancient period, in the medieval period, because sex is bad, women like it, mm -hmm. right? And so the minute we as a society change our mind about something, then suddenly women can't be good at it. And it is really interesting. I was I was giving a talk about this to the Feminist Society in Cambridge the other week, and I was talking about how one of the most common roles for women in the medieval period was as uh, bookkeepers. And then someone said to me, well, how do, in the medieval period, how do they reconcile the idea that women are really stupid with the fact that they're doing maths and maths is really hard? And I was like, well, they didn't think maths was very hard because women do it and therefore <laughs> it's easy. And everyone was like, oh, and I was like, yeah. You ever consider that maybe math isn't hard and you've just been told over and over that it isn't because most women have been driven out of it as a mm -hmm. career. So, you know, there's these social ways of looking at things. So, you know, for example, in the medieval period, you would never see a woman who was considered, you, well, you do, okay, I won't say you never see because certainly Hildegard of Bingen exists, right? Mm -hmm. But you very rarely see other than like Eloise of Montreal or, you know, Hildegard of Bingen, you know, these two women, I can just like say, pow, pow, what about these two? You very rarely see celebrated theologian women, whereas men are celebrated theologians all the time. And theologians are like rock stars in the medieval period. It's like, yeah. oh, these are the coolest guys. And it's because, oh, well, women are too simple and too stupid to understand the humanities. They couldn't possibly get their heads around Aristotle, right? <laughs> whereas now it's like, oh, well, you know, women, they just always do the humanities. They just always do the arts. And that's how you can tell that the arts are stupid because women <laughs> do that. We're just always doing this mental gymnastics to assure ourselves that, as the phrase goes, a woman's place is in the wrong. Right? <laughs> so... <laughs> If women yeah. are good at it, then it must be easy and stupid and anyone can do it. And if women are bad at it, quote unquote, it's good. But, you know, it turns out women aren't bad at it. They're just told you're not good at maths and you don't like <laughs> sex. Have fun. You know? <laughs> Don't try to do both at the same time. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing that you said is consistent throughout history is that women need to be beautiful. It's just mm -hmm. a fact. <laughs> so how did women look beautiful in the Middle Ages? What was that ideal like? So this is the thing about when you talk about beauty in the Middle Ages, there is one ideal <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and it stays the same. So uh, in the earlier medieval period, you hear a lot less about it. You know, if you go look at things from, you know, the year 700 or something, they're kind of like, she was beautiful. And you're like, OK, homie, thanks. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. And you, a lot of the time you're reminded that women are beautiful, usually so that you know that they're holy or that they've got a right to be queen. These are kind of like the two things. So it's like your beauty necessarily shows that you should have an honored place in society and also that God likes you. We get to the 12th century, though, and they decide that they are going to make some rules around this place about what it means to be hot. And we particularly see this from a guy, Geoffrey of Vinsoff, who like writes down, hey, everybody, if you're going to do a literary portrait of a woman, this is how it is that she has to look. And you kind of start at the head and you scan down to the feet. So you start at the head and she's got to be blonde, non-negotiable. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. blonde, blonde is the one. And then she needs a really high forehead we want a receding hairline essentially on a woman and which they often call a free and clear head she's supposed to have arched eyebrows that are black which question mark along with the <laughs> blonde hair but okay interesting and they should not be a monobrow which yeah. is uh, interesting and funny because it's kind of in comparison to some ancient greek texts they're really light on descriptions of women women but occasionally they're like and she had a monobrow oh yeah you know i'm like <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you know, fair enough. She should have white skin, gray eyes, a nose that is neither too big nor too small, cheeks red like roses, a kind of like pouty, pouty little mouth that's often described as being like a rosebud, white teeth, a neck long and white like a swan, mm -hmm. although sometimes it's also like a pillar, small rounded shoulders, small high breasts, 
a pot belly, which they mm-hmm. they call a luscious little belly, which I really, really like. <laughs> and then she needs to be packing heat in the back. We want dump truck ass, <laughs> thick thighs, long legs, and small feet. So all in all, what this means is that a woman has a pear shape. And she should have like a, you know, and be like vaguely balding, right? Okay, so, and then this is like, what is hot? To the point where women in medieval portraiture, even in, if you want to use the term Renaissance, which I don't, but like, even when you get to the Renaissance, this is how women are depicted if they're beautiful. Very occasionally, if the picture is based on a woman in real life, she can be a brunette. That's basically it. An example of this I use is from the Ghent altarpiece by Jan van Eyck, which is one of my favorite things that ever happened anyway. But (laughs) it shows all of the virgin martyrs coming to see the Lamb of Christ at the end of the world. And here comes like the big parade of the virgin martyrs. And the virgin martyrs are all beautiful, of course, because they're saints. So, of course, they're beautiful, right? And they are completely interchangeable. Like the only reason (laughs) that you can tell who St. Agnes is is she's carrying a tiny lamb. If St. Catherine didn't have the wheels embroidered on her dress, you wouldn't know who she was because they all look exactly the same. They all have the same hair. They have the same eyes. Like, this is what it means to be beautiful, right? So, okay, there's this one way to be beautiful and all women need to be beautiful because to be beautiful is to be exalted and to be loved by God. But I swear to God, girl, if you do anything (laughs) to live up to this beauty standard, then you are going to hell, period. For example, you know, there's all of this emphasis on your eyebrows and what your eyebrows need to be like and having this really high forehead, right? So, you know, a lot of women do depilatory creams or they pluck, right? And there's (laughs) this hell vision I found where a, a man's beautiful wife dies and he's really sad about it. And so he goes to this monk who is reported to be able to have like visions of the afterlife. So he pays the monk off and says, oh, monk, can you tell me what's going on with my wife? And the monk comes back and goes, "Mm, yeah, your wife's in hell. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And why is his wife in hell? Uh, His wife's in hell because she plucked her eyebrows and she plucked her hairline. And now she's in hell having demons gnaw on her forehead where she (laughs) used to pluck her hair. And it's like, there you go. Right. So, you know, even if the beauty standard is really completely different to our own. What's familiar is this thing where you should not even be aware that there's a beauty standard. Don't you dare live up to this thing. Like all society is set up to say that you better be hot. But if you for even a moment like, acknowledge <laughs> that that exists and, and try to live up to it, then you're sinful and you're bad. And it's actually not beautiful anymore at all if you <laughs> if you try it, right? So there's this real kind of desire to have it both ways on the part of women is that you you need to be beautiful, but completely unaware of it. And you can't have tried at all whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I think that is so consistent right, right mm-hmm. now. Like there's that one One Direction song where it's like, you don't know you're beautiful. You don't know you're beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me I, 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 just, I tried to quote it in the book because <laughs> I hated it so much. And they were like, this is actually too old now. And I was like, oh, I'm so old. I feel like that just came out. But yeah, right? it drives me up a wall, yeah. that song. So yeah, I, I even learned how to cite songs in footnotes <laughs> for that. And then my editor was like, girl, you're so old. I was like, oh. <laughs> But that's what it is. And I mean, I think that's that's still the case where you're supposed to look beautiful on Instagram, for example. I'm probably making mm-hmm. myself sound old too. But you can't try to make yourself look beautiful mm-hmm. because that is an, a no-no. And even though today I think it's not always associated with sin. I think for some people it is. But today you're just supposed to be beautiful. Yeah. Just yeah, appear like, beautiful. <laughs> I suppose that's the thing that changes. It's not like, oh, this isn't a damnable offense, but it is certainly, you know, it, it means that you haven't really done it correctly. So yeah, sure. Maybe you're not going to hell, but you're definitely also not going to attract the right kind of attention. Yeah. The right kind of attention that, that has to go in oh, air quotes yeah, too, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> so you explore in your final chapter about beauty, just how often these things change and how this is attributed to like biology in some crazy ways. Can you tell us a little bit oh. about what you dug up over that? Because, oh, yeah. Wow. So, 
<laughs> a big part of the reason that um, I wrote this book is I hate Evo psychologists. <laughs> I, I mean, I, like granted, not all of them, but a lot of them. And particularly a thing that irks me about Evo psychologists is they'll say, um, oh, this thing that we that is the beauty standard now, you think that this is hot because actually this is like premium fertility. And that's why men think this is hot. And I'm like, if men have always found hourglass shapes beautiful, why do medieval people like you know, like, they, no, they don't. They like pear shape, right? So it, mm-hmm. it's just historically incorrect. You cannot say that beauty standards as are a result of an evolutionary process, which takes millions of years. If for hundreds upon hundreds of years, nobody agreed that this was hot. And we're just talking here about like the global north as well, right? We're talking mm-hmm. about beauty standards for Europeans for most of this. But, you know, even if we took like that, what they say, you know, the idealized hot woman is now, it doesn't hold true everywhere in the world. You know, there's no universal standards of beauty for anything other than like cleanliness and good skin. That's it. <laughs> and no one agrees on everything else. So it's not possible. It's not possible that uh, everyone has always found hourglass figures beautiful throughout all time because it's just not true. And then kind of like on top of that, there are, if we're going outside of beauty standards as well, there are like these ridiculous new ideas about gendered brains. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh boy. Which are quite funny where people will say, oh, you know, like you can, there are just, there's just a difference in men and women's brains and uh, ladies brains are better at things like being mommies and communicating and men's brains are better at making cars, right? Like this is, this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. Now, Plenty of neuropsychologists who actually work on brains who are women are like, no, that's not how it works, right? Because brains are kind of in many ways sort of like a muscle where it's like if you work a particular part more often, then it just becomes more developed. You know, it's like how uh, I used to be great at geometry, but I never do it anymore. So I would if you asked me to find the area of a circle, I'd be like "Uh, for, you know, 10 minutes and then I'd eventually figure it out. Right. (laughs) But I used to be able to do it off the top of my head. Same thing for basically anything. So the point is our society kind of pushes women into roles where they have to be mommies and they have to read everybody's emotions. And so our brains do develop those things. But it's because of a social construct, not because our brains always would have done that. And, you know, it's kind of one thing if we just go, haha, that's quite laughable. But you have people who literally advocate for, for example, um, segregating children at school because they're like oh well girls just can't learn like that they just can't learn math so you should just put them in a totally different class and teach them in a different way and it's like that is a real world danger based Mm -hmm. on absolutely nothing and you know again go back to the medieval people they would have been like maths that's for girls Mm -hmm. that's ladies work (laughs) so don't don't bother boys with things like that you better you need to be getting them looking at plato right now that's what that's what a real man does right so All of these things are just in this constant state of flux. And we need to really be careful when we say that any of these ideas come about as a part of an evolutionary process. That's not what society is. And things being social constructs are every bit as important as something being a biological conceit. Yeah, I think that's so important. And what I love about reading this, I like to read psychology. That's what I read in my spare time. Mm. And you have a lot of women who are going hey, wait, we forgot about this one part of the experiment, which throws off the entire result. Like, we need to look at the social aspect of it. And that, Mm. I mean, that is what your book is doing, right? Looking at what are the social constructs and how Ah. have they changed? Mm. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because for a bunch of people who walk around in society all the time, we really don't spend a lot of time looking at it, you know? (laughs) Uh, People kind of seem to think that society is sort of like oxygen and it's just sort of there. You know, and and not something that we're kind of building all the time. But I mean, I suppose that it is rather like oxygen in that it's something that people are really unable to see, even though they're participating in it and creating it all the time. But I mean, I suppose also I I want to be clear that that's what I think the good news is. Yes. Because if things are constructs, then you can unconstruct them. (laughs) <laughs> <Which is good. laughs> yeah, the book, it is a book of love, it is a book of hate, but in the end, it's a book of hope because you're saying if these are constructed, we can change it, which I think is mm. important. I do want to get to women's work because I think that, hey. yeah, we've had a couple of podcasts over the last few months that talk about women's work, but I want to get your take on it because now in the last couple of centuries, there's been like this real tension, like women should be at home and mm. then they shouldn't be working. Oh, wait, they should be working. What was the medieval take on women's work? 
uh, yeah, that women work. <laughs> that's just it. Like that's, you know, sure. You know, the thing that women are for is to be a wives and mothers. Right. And, you know, the mother part is obvious. You know, you should be giving birth to children because ooh, one of them might be a man and then your life might be worthwhile. Fantastic. Like you made more men. Congratulations. <laughs> but also you are supposed to be a wife. And the thing that you do as a wife is not just bear children, but you're a help me. So you do all the same work that your husband does. So if you're a peasant woman, you're out there plowing right alongside of him. And then there are all these kind of gendered forms of work that are only for women. So, for example, household chores. Yeah. See, all of them. Right. Like as I where men, men don't do any of those. Just like absolutely not. No. Uh, and sure, you know, there's probably like slightly gender things is like men are probably more likely to chop wood, mm -hmm. for example. But women do like animal husbandry. For example, so like women are the ones looking after the chickens and the cows. You know, women are the ones who make butter and make cheese. And women are the ones who do the brewing. Women are the ones who do all of the cooking. Uh, women are the ones who clean the inside of the house. Women do laundry, blah, 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 blah. Like all the things that you would expect to see. But it's worth mentioning this because that's real work and it's very, mm -hmm. very difficult. No one's doing that for fun. As I say in the book, you can tell that nobody's doing it for fun because when people become rich, the first thing they do is get a cleaner. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, they're like, get, please just get anyone else to do this for me. So you have all of that. And then you've got farm chores on top of that if you're a peasant. Now, there is also for kind of middle class women, especially in cities, a whole range of other forms of employment that you might have. Um, even in the countryside, you know, you might be employed as a dairy maid or a chambermaid. So kind of like helping out with sewing and things like that. Or you can be a cook, you know, all kinds of kitchen work is, is largely done by women. But if you get into the cities and you can take a look at guilds, now a lot of times women are not allowed to be members of guilds, but we know that they are doing the same work as members of guilds. And a great way to realize that is that sometimes women suddenly can be members of guilds <laughs> when their husband dies. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, say you are, I don't know, a Fletcher. And and your husband dies, suddenly the Fletchers might say, okay, well, that's fine. You can come on in. You're a member of the guild because everybody knows that you're good at making arrows. So so mm -hmm. in you in you come. And then that can stand for women unless they remarry. Yeah. And then if you remarry, then that's all bets are off because you are either A, marrying another member of that same group of people, which means that you're going to keep doing the work anyway, but your husband's name is just going to be the one that goes on the guild role, for example. Or you are marrying a man from outside of the guild, in which case, well, you are going to start doing that work instead. So, you know, I don't know, maybe you marry a glover. Okay, well, now suddenly you're sewing gloves and you're not making arrows, right? <laughs> so these are all different things. Women also occasionally have their own guilds. So, for example, silk weaving is particularly feminized and the silk guilds are all just women, just a bunch of women hanging out. Um, women can also be, for example, fullers, which are kind of cloth, is a part of the cloth making process. And women also a lot of the time um, can be in guilds for bathhouses. Although there'll be like rules that say, okay, well, you can be running a bathhouse, but you can't be at the top of the, <laughs> the guild union, right? So it's like only men are like on the advisory boards, but you could be running your own bathhouse. So you can tell that women are involved in all of these things because of the rules governing sort of what you do with them. And, you know, as a result of this, we often see that women, for example, marry men who are in the same profession as their fathers were because they will have been trained up from birth to kind of do that job in their house. And so then that makes you a really good wife. And then, you know, you get to the highest echelons of society, of course, like a noble women and queens. And that is a form of work. Being a member of the nobility means that you're doing diplomatic work at all times, you know, and you may be called upon to do things for the queen if you are a noble woman. You might travel rather extensively. A lot of them lend money to mm -hmm. each other. This is a big way of them uh, making making money. And then, of course, also they run their houses, which is to say their castles. <laughs> and that's kind of like the equivalent of managing a hotel, essentially, where it's like you have to keep an eye on like the incomings and outgoings. You oversee all of your serfs. You know, you have to know how much you're going to tax them. You have to understand what the harvests are coming in and going out. You need to know how much food you need to feed people. These are really high level, complex sets of tasks that women specifically do. And it doesn't matter if your husband is home or not, that is women's work. So I think that that is really important to point out. And, and then of course there's nuns, 
Because <laughs> you can elect to not get married. That's the one thing is you can become a nun. One of the things that I always say, like, if I could choose, if I was forced to go back to the medieval period and I could choose what to be, I would choose to be a nun. Because then you get to dork around with books, right? Like, mm -hmm. maybe you are doing copies of texts or maybe you're Hildegard and, you know, you you write your own theological works. They do a lot of art and they can illuminate manuscripts, things like that, or work in hospitals. You know, they have these really complex um, intellectual lives, which I think is really, really cool. So, yeah, it's, it's quite funny, this idea that women are necessarily domestic creatures and all they do is the work, which is real, like real work inside a house, is so modern that it's laughable. You know, this is a kind <laughs> of post-enlightenment construct that only really held true in the Victorian era and slightly after World War II, like in kind of the Fordist consensus. But other than that, women have been working the entire time. Even when we are talking about the modern era and the idea that women are just stay-at-home moms, that was only a small slice of society for who that was true. You know, working class women have been working the entire time. And, you know, the hint's kind of in the name there, right? So <laughs> I, it just makes me laugh, this idea that, like, women should just be at home because I'm like, says who? You know, says who? Enlightenment philosophers, all of whom I will see in hell. Uh, so... <laughs> You know, it's like Rousseau's wrong on this one. I got to tell you. I got to tell you. <laughs> it's one of these things where you can see the matrix, right? You can see the social constructs when you have people saying women are too delicate to do this work. The only people who are too delicate to do that work are the people who maybe are rich enough not to have to do it because otherwise mm -hmm. they are there. They're in the trenches. They are working hard with Absolutely. their physical bodies, right? Yeah. And I mean, like literally in the trenches at some point in time, like we see women who are soldiers who are like mercenary soldiers. We see women working as city guards, like you name it, women are doing it. It's not like there's some kind of work that is solely for women and it's always dainty. You know, women are doing <laughs> everything all the time because, well, someone's got to get some work done around here, you know? Mm -hmm. There's this one poem, and I don't know if you've mentioned it in the book or not, but there's a poem, and I think it's in Eve Salisbury's Trials and Joys of Marriage, but there's a poem where the man says, I work a lot harder than you, and the woman says, hang on a second, and she lists all the things she has to do during the day, and then they switch, but the rest of the manuscript is lost. <laughs> <laughs> oh no yeah so oh, there's that's a this, cliffhanger yeah so there's this idea of like what happens when you throw a man into the role of a woman peasant like what's gonna happen but we don't know we don't know what happened yeah. i talk a lot about um there's this really great source um called a letter on virginity which is basically like girls be a nun <laughs> don't get married is, is kind of like the, the thrust of it. But it, it's got this great bit where it says, um, what kind of position is a woman in when coming in from work, she sees the cow at the filch and the dog on the counter and her loaf is burning and the child is crying and the pot's bubbling over and her <laughs> husband is complaining. <laughs> and, like, and it's so vivid right because like you see the woman coming in from work like she's doing work somewhere else here's all these other chores that have to be done there are all these things going wrong and the husband's just sitting there not doing any of them because like that's women's work and he doesn't do it and it just it does make your blood rise in exactly that same way still which is why you can tell it's this really effective form of propaganda where you're like yeah fair play maybe i will be a nun damn like, <laughs> you know Yes, sign me up. Sign me up. I want to be a nun. Mm. So your book does end on a hopeful note. So tell us what do you want people to take from this study of looking at where women were, how things changed, where we are today. Where do you want to leave people when they finish the book? I want them to realize, you know, the, the point of this is all these things are in flux. We change our ideas about women constantly. And the only thing that we keep the same is that women are wrong. Right. <laughs> so that should tell us that, you know, all of the things that we hold to be true, all these idea about that women are this immutable thing and it's always been so are just not true. You know, these are not real ideas. Uh, they are just something that we've kind of agreed upon doing. So social constructs are, you know, something that governs our lives and they have real world impacts and ramifications, but it's something that we agree to do. It's something that we're all kind of involved in manufacturing at all times. And so if we're doing that, then we can just decide to stop. Right? <laughs> like We don't have to say, yeah, you know what, actually, I think that the, the most important thing about women is that they bear children. We don't have to believe that. We can just pick that up 
and and toss it out. You know, that that isn't an important thing at all. And we also don't have to concede this idea that women are these like gentle, meek little not men that need protection and need society to kind of set things up in a particular way from them. You know, nothing can be further from the truth. You know, women are simply people. And we can decide how it is that we are going to relate to women. And we don't actually have to just take as written that this is the way things should be. You know, this is the way things are, but we can at any point in time rewrite what the future is going to be. And it really helps to do that if you understand that all of this is nonsense, right? <laughs> well, that is the perfect place to end this. All of this is nonsense. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming back on, Eleanor. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and good luck with the new book. Thank you so much, Danielle. It's just a, a delight to be here as always. To find out more about Eleanor's work, you can follow her on Twitter at Going Medieval, or you can visit her website at going-medieval.com. Her new book is The Once and Future Sex, Going Medieval on Women's Roles in Society. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on this week, Peter? Hey, hey, well, we have something coming up in just a couple of weeks on April 1st, actually. It's an online conference about Easter in late antiquity and the Middle Ages. So we've been partnering with the people that run the journal After Constantine. They've done all the hard work. I'm just kind of latching on. But it's a, like an online conference just talking about the various aspects of Easter and how it kind of influenced the Middle Ages. So that's from the religious standpoint, but also it affected how we medieval people created calendars. There's a lot of social history because with Christians and other religions, there's always tensions around Easter and a whole bunch of other kind of interesting things that are reflected from this holiday. And it was an important event for hundreds and hundreds of years in the, in the medieval world. So I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to that. And people can sign up for free through our website to attend as online for a one day conference, uh, about a dozen speakers, not me. So I, I'm just there to listen and do, introduce a couple of people, but some really good speakers are kind of lined up for that. That sounds awesome. As you say, it was a really important and controversial topic. I think people think of Easter as being kind of solidified now, but it was a real hot topic back in the day. Yeah, yeah. People got really riled up for Easter. Sometimes in good ways, sometimes not so good ways. But yeah, I always think it's interesting to look at the day-to-day -day lives of medieval people. And this is one of the important days of the calendar. Literally, the medieval calendar is often created around Easter. Mm -hmm. Well, people will have to sign up and check that out. Yeah. So we've got that. Plus, I'm looking at a couple of new books that just arrived on my doorstep. They're both from uh, Penguin, the part of the Penguin Classics series. So one is called Merits of the Plague by Ibn Hajar al Axlini. And he's a 15th century Egyptian writer, and he goes through the plague. He actually suffers through it himself, has relatives that passed away from it. And he he goes in and tries to write, what are the thoughts about it within the community? Like, you know, what are the issues, religious issues, issues about, you know, what to do when the plague comes to town? So it's a really fascinating work. And we have very few sources from the Islamic world looking at, say, the Black Death or pandemics that have been translated. So this is a really fascinating piece. And also another book, Leo Africanus's Geography and Cosmology of Africa. And this is a very famous early 16th century piece. Uh, Leo Africanus is a Tunisian diplomat that gets captured on the on Mediterranean by pirates, it winds up in Italy, converts to Christianity for a while, where he is this person that's like at the papal court writing stuff, including this history of Africa. And then at one point, he goes back to Tunisia and converts back to Islam. So we don't hear anything about him. So we're only kind of left with these works. But this particular piece is one of the most uh, important sources about history of Africa, including like Timbuktu. And it hasn't been translated in hundreds of years. There's been an old 17th century translation that some scholars have made use of. But uh, up until now, there hasn't been a full English version. So I'm really excited that Penguin Classics has put this out. Penguin's doing great stuff. Really <laughs> There's always great translations. And the nice thing about Penguins is they're cheap. Everyone can access them. They are. They are. I, I, these two books just came out in the uh, last couple of days. I had to pick them up right away. Eventually, I will do something uh, to promote these books and tell people others. But so right now, I'm just reading them. <laughs> All right. Well, this is making me think of two things. 
So people who are interested in Monica Green's work on Muslim perspectives on the plague are going to find this first source really interesting because she talks about how having the idea of plagues sort of at the forefront of religious thought for them gave them a different perspective. So people who are interested in Monica Green's work on that, she did a talk on that, I think it was in the fall last year. And then when we, when I think of Leo Africanus, I think of Monica, but I also think of Natalie Zeman Davis. So anyone that listened to the podcast with Natalie a while back might be interested in that second source. Yes, yes. Natalie did that Trickster's Travels, which is all about Leo. And yeah, so I'm doubly interested in, in reading this source just to see how like Natalie looked at it and then look at it ourselves. Yeah. Well, you are set for the weekend. Thanks so much, Peter, for coming on and telling us about what's new on the website. Thanks. If you tuned into the podcast last week, you heard me tell you all about the new podcast I'm creating called Extra Medieval. It's a show just for subscribers where I get to expand on the topics covered on the Medieval Podcast, as well as tell you about new articles, historical tidbits, and even modern research. This week, I'll be dropping the first official episode of Extra Medieval, in which I talk more about medieval women, their roles in society, and how these concepts affect us today, as well as telling the medieval story of one of the most joyfully celebrated saints in the world, St. Patrick. Join me for Extra Medieval on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Patreon. Which brings me to thanking, as always, all of you patrons on Medievalist.net's Patreon page, whose generosity helps to support my podcast and the work of other indie writers and podcasters who contribute to their website. Patrons can access all sorts of great stuff like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, as well as ad-free versions of this podcast and Extra Medieval. To get in on all the action, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from ladies to the 80s, follow medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an awesome day. Yeah.